Greetings and welcome to Growth Hacking Secrets. I'm your host, Mohammed Sadiq from Atlanta, Georgia. On this episode, we have a special guest, Pablo Gonzalez. Pablo is a B2B community builder, podcast host, and co-founder and CMO at the Be the Stage Live. Please join me to give a warm welcome to our guest, Pablo Gonzalez. Pablo, one hey, more Let me start with this. Where were you? What happened? Who were you surrounded with? that inspired you to do what you do today? Oh, man. Honestly, man, it was my brother's funeral about eight years ago when I looked around and I found myself in a Catholic church and there was 1,200 people that showed up for his funeral. And, you know, growing up, I, I had my issues with the Catholic church but I stayed active as a, as a family ritual. And when I looked around that church and I saw 1200 people, it instantly hit me that these people are my community. And the last two years of my brother's struggle with pancreatic cancer were made much more bearable with the support of this community. And this moment, this worst moment ever was much more bearable with the support of a community and it struck me that a community, a well-formed community is the greatest value that one can offer. And once that hit me, I realized that relationships are built off value and businesses are built off value. And if community is this great value, then there must be a business model around providing community as a business model. And organized religion was proving it right in front of my face. And as I started thinking through that, you know, your reticular activator starts to hit and you start seeing patterns everywhere. I started thinking, man, if somebody gets a Harley Davidson, they can't switch bikes because they'll lose their friends, right? Like they have this kinship with each other and Apple products do the same thing. And who else is doing it out in the ecosystem? And I just started really breaking down how you create community as a vehicle for client acquisition, lowering cost of acquisition and increasing lifetime value of clients. And it led me to where I'm at today. Based on your experience, what are the top three reasons why do people fail? I think imposter syndrome is probably number one, right? Like this, this idea that the story we tell ourselves is probably the least kind story, right? That voice inside your head is the least friendly person that you allow in your inner circle. And I think that limits people a lot. And that, you know, that voice gets formed by nature and nurture and a bunch of other things. But I think that's most of it is, is people, at least in the United States of America, right? It's people that can't get over that narrative that's happening inside their head. Second is likely a, 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 a people around you telling you the same thing, right? If you can't surround yourself with, with people that believe in you and be able to like cut through the negative talk outside of your head, it's likely going to limit you. And third is being born with just strategic disadvantages, right? Just if you are, I, I, I very much understand that I was blessed by being born into a family that has supported me and, and not, having to unravel intergenerational traumas and different things that people grow up with when they grow up in hardship that has allowed me to have this positive mentality. It's made it easy for me to be surrounded by people that are the same way. And uh, not everybody is that fortunate. What is your greatest failure story? What did you learn and how did you recover from it? My greatest failure story is uh, when I really decided to take up this this mission of community creation for business development. My first thing was I, I applied it to my career in Miami in construction and, and I was having great success. And I knew that in order to grow and in order to really prove this thing, I had to step out of this environment and prove this at a grander scale. And I took the opportunity to come up here to Jacksonville and partner up with somebody and and be a part of this startup. And it was really the first time that I stepped out on a limb where my dad was giving me his best advice and I was going against it in my career and in, in a big decision. And at the end of the day, the partnership didn't work out. And I found myself in 2019 
reinventing myself again after having proven what I wanted to prove within the partnership, but it not being the right next step. And the way that I recovered from it was reframing it. I took 90 days of a purposeful pause to, instead of taking the best, you know, taking the best next step, I decided to really step back at some distance and figure out where I want to be in 10 years and reverse engineer. And in creating that distance, I was able to reframe this idea that yes, the partnership didn't work out, but this theory that I had, this thesis that I have of community creation for business development actually worked within this company. And in a very, very chaotic, limited resource environment, it was the shining star of what propelled it forward. And I didn't have to beat myself up for this failure in judgment of who I was going to partner with and think of this as a dead end as much as think of this as I took this step outside of the box and now I'm in this different arena and I've proven it in this case. And you know that reframing, I like to say that without distance, there is no perspective, right? So gaining that distance from the issue and from what I was struggling with was what allowed me to take the inventory of the things that I could learn from it and leave behind the things that I really didn't like. What are your top three success secrets that others can model from? I'm constantly, there's, there's three things that I'm generally doing all the time that have led me to where I'm at right now. And I'm not somebody that I'll, I'll openly tell you, I, I struggle with discipline and building in habits and, and the little things that get me there. I'm a kind of a big picture guy and I can pitch something and get people motivated. But the things that definitely have worked for me is leaning into the idea that right now mentorship is at scale everywhere on the internet. The discovery of podcasts for me was huge because I had a really hard time reading books because I, you know, I'd have a hard time concentrating. I don't know if it's ADD or not, but getting into podcasts and getting into audiobooks and building that into my drives and my walk of the dog and my cooking time and you know all these other downtimes that I could be constantly learning something allowed me to really start to learn a bunch of things when I was in a dead end of my career in a construction company 10 years ago. So that started opening up my mind. That led me to Gary V and his philosophies and putting out content and a way to reframe things, right? That's so leaning into being a lifelong learner is huge. The second is I'm always connecting with people. And that to me is the key to the success, right? Relationships are a compounding interest. There is no relation. Once you build a relationship, there is no going back from that. It just keeps adding. And if you do it right, then those are doors that can always open. I see every relationship I build as the potential to create a positive black swan, uh, meaning a moment that completely changes the trajectory of everything I'm doing because all of a sudden I have access to something that I never thought I had before. So continuously connecting and being a very purposeful networker is absolutely at the center of that, being the, the learner of things and then connecting and learning through others and connecting those dots is the third piece. It's the cross contextualization. If you get, if you start practicing the muscle of what have you learned in one instance from this type of person and how do you connect the dots to another person in another instant? And what is there to learn from a different scenario? What is, what is the lesson there? And you can share that, uh, that will open a ton of doors and lead to more connections and put everything, magnify everything else. I call it, you know, that piece and constantly talking about the things that you are trying to connect the dots on, right? Like I call it being a bat signal for the things that you want to attract. So if you are constantly learning, constantly connecting with people and constantly trying to cross that context between those things and speaking about it openly, um, that is that is the key to my success. And the best way to do that for me is putting out tons of content online, right? About like the things you learn from other people. What motivates you within? It's funny. It's funny that you say within, uh, Muhammad, because I'm very extrinsically motivated. I'm I'm very much a people pleaser and and uh, an extreme extrovert. And you know, it's it's really motivation that I get from 
uh, making other people feel good and, and, and keeping up to that. So the thing that's most motivated me now is that I've been able to build this team of people that, that work with me and are betting their future on, on my company and my vision and all these different things and keeping myself accountable to them and really following through for them is, is, is my greatest motivation. Is that part of that interconnectivity with other people? That connection is really what motivates me the most. What is your company's motto? <laughs> Everyone has value. So that is, that's the motto. Our mission is to create a world where everybody is empowered to recognize their value and share it with others because we really, really believe in this idea that this quote from Walt Waldo Emerson, that is every man I meet in my walks, every man I meet is in some way my superior and in that I can learn from him is something we take to heart, right? Like everybody, everybody you come across, Muhammad, everybody I come across has thought about something slightly different or slightly longer than you've thought about it, experienced things differently. And if you get really, really good at understanding what that valuable piece is that they have learned and internalize it and learn from it and learn how to share that with others, uh, that leads to great, great opportunities for yourself and it leads to a greater world. Who is your ideal client? My ideal client is a company that has won growth awards like the Inc. 5000 or, uh, you know, like Business Journal, fastest growing company, stuff like that, that have also won best place to work awards. So these companies that value culture and how culture leads to growth, we call that relationship driven growth. You're going to find that companies that do this have a different way of doing business development that is much more relationship driven. They have a different way of hiring that's much more related. Those are the people that we, that's who we are and that's who we like to work with because what we do of creating these internet talk shows as a um, go-to-market strategy, that's a value aggregated business development mechanism works really, really well for them. How do you find your ideal client? I find my ideal client the same exact way that I uh, service my ideal clients, right? We have a show where we bring on businesses that highlight these values that highlight our core values of relationship driven growth. And we interview them uh, along with a live audience that tunes in uh, via a captive platform. So we don't stream live to everything like, uh, like StreamYard does. We host it intimately on zoom so we can start building a community within that. And then we repurpose all that content and we spread it out. We talk it, we call it planting one seed, you know, creating one seed and planting it in, 25 different pots across six different ecosystems. So by connecting to the people that we most admire, that we want to do business with, and then making marketing collateral around them that we then distribute organically through ours and their networks is a really, really good way of being present in front of the people that you want to see. And that leads to a bunch of sales conversations about what we're doing. How do you deliver a five-star client experience? By being obsessed with the clients and what they are trying to achieve. I think companies too often are, 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 are really stuck on what is the value prop for me as opposed to what's the value prop for them. By seeing the world through your client's eyes, you're able to deliver a five-star client experience. I'll give you an example, right? Until very recently, we only had one product, which is the done for you weekly internet talk show. It became very clear to us that there was a market opportunity for us to you know, not just have one thing that we charge $8,500 a month for, but to create kind of like a crawl package, walk package, and a run package being that, that final $8,500 a month. And we could have easily said, okay, so what things can we lop off to provide a cheaper service to get more clients? But we didn't. What we thought really, really hard about was what can we provide as value to them that's going to get them to that highest level, right? Not, a, not what kind of things can we take off versus things that we can cross off a list, but how can we design the experience in a way that's going to continue to grow their business, that's going to make them want to elevate and do more of this stuff. And at the end of the day, that's what the client wants, right? So really figuring out what the win-win is, where, where you lie in your client's journey and how you can get them to where they want to be in a way that's mutually beneficial to you is the only way to do it. How do you convert your clients into your brand ambassadors? I mean, we do this naturally, right? We did, this is part of our, this is part of our client acquisition process is providing them a great example, having them on a show, kind of like you're doing with me, Muhammad, and then creating these micro content pieces that we distribute 
that allows us to be what I call guilty by association with them, right? If we're putting them, making them look in a really, really good light and distributing these things, anybody that tunes in because they see their friend is on TV um, will see that I'm giving them a great experience and, you know, then they're curious about what we do and some of them enroll into what we're doing. And uh, so long story short is by co-creating content with them. How do you handle the rejections? <laughs> You know, I think there's there's a there's an old saying in sales that uh, the second best word you can hear is no, right? I think rejections are a data point. Rejections are a data point that tell you that that client is not interested in what you're doing, or you're not providing enough value to what they're trying to achieve uh, in order for them to want to accept it. Therefore, the two options that you have is to respect it and go away, or figure out how you can add more value. You're never I heard somebody say this once, if you can stack your value higher than your client's cash, you will never have a problem, right? As long as you are providing more value than what they are able to pay for, then you're never going to have an issue. So when you get rejected, you need to look at your value proposition and you need to look at what you're actually doing for them, and what they're getting from it based on what you are offering. How do you handle an angry client? You know, Mohammed, I haven't had a lot of experiences with uh, with angry clients because we're really customer focused. I don't think that people, when they're when they are very very angry, they're just triggered and they're not in their right mind. And I think you need to have a little bit of space. You need to uh, be able to be the person that de-escalates the situation and you know stay true to your integrity and have the conversation as calmly as you can, and be willing to walk away. And you know, you don't have to. as long as you are looking to validate where their pain comes from. We are about to move into lightning round. That means quick question and quick answer. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know how good I am at that, but yeah, I'm ready. What are you grateful for today? Oh, I, I'm grateful for an opportunity to connect with somebody that's doing something really interesting like yourself, Mohamed. How do you start your day? I start my day generally uh, walking my dog and listening to a podcast. So I start my day learning and, and being outdoors. How young are you? <laughs> I am 41 years young. Pablo, you are not 41. You are 18 years old. The rest is all experience. All right. What do you want to do when you grow up? What do I want to do when I grow up? I want to do this, man. I want to, I, I want to, I want to build this business. Uh, in order to serve people at scale, I want to have a platform that allows me to help people for free because I'm creating so much value for my high playing cl clients at an enterprise level that the average person is just able to benefit from my experience that I will share freely, kind of like the Gary Vee model. What is your plan to achieve your goal? Build out this company, man. I'm, I'm, I'm living it right now. This Be The Stage Live is exactly that. I get to um, produce my own show and live my own truth while serving people and, and doing what I do. I, I built a business around the thing that I love doing that I think I'm really good at doing being the thing that drives the business, which is seeing value in others and communicating it to the world. What is the advice you will give to a younger yourself? Fail sooner. Allow yourself to allow yourself to fail and, and take those risks early to learn how to fail. Once you have a revenue generating idea, how do you convince your significant other? Oh man, uh, that, that's a lightning. <laughs> Clear communication and empathy, right? Just as much as as much diving into this idea of like where is the fear coming from and you know, like validating what their, what their fear is and building that into your equation as much as possible. And the clear understanding that people that love you the most have a different set of priorities than you do when you're in growth mode. When you're in growth mode, you inevitably have to become uncomfortable with things and go into unknown situations and take risks. People that love you want you to be comfortable. So you have to have the self-awareness that Whatever advice they're giving you, if they really care for you, is coming from a place of, of 
wanting what's best for you and in their head, what's best for you is comfort. When in your head, what's best for you may be uh, discomfort and you have to make peace with that. Who is your living mentor and what's the impact? That's it. My living mentor, uh, I would say my, my biggest two mentors are my dad, who the impact is seeing a man of great integrity that has been able to navigate life and build profitable businesses while having a highly functioning family that all really, really appreciates each other, uh, that I see as a really, really high integrity guy. And then the other guy that I consider a mentor is is Gary Vaynerchuk. I see, I, I think that Gary and I have the same chemistry. Like I think we were born with very similar kind of like outlooks on things and he had a different formation than I had. So what works for him works for me greatly. If I'm able to build in the, the kind of like inborn grit and, and work ethic that he loves so much. So uh, those two. Why being impactful and important to you? Uh, it comes from gratitude, man. I think that I was born into a really, really fortunate situation. And if I'm not leaving the, the world a better place, then, um, then, then I didn't deserve it. Right. So I need to, I need to create some kind of impact based on the fact that I was born with a bunch of really great strategic advantages of a wonderful family and being healthy and, you know, resources at my disposal. What do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered exactly like my brother is remembered, right? Like after that, um, after that funeral, the people that I connected with to a T came up to me and said, you know, when I knew that your brother was in the room, I knew that I would belong. Uh, he was somebody that was making people feel comfortable and, and would make you laugh and would bring you in. And, and that, and that to me was one of the, the really big aha moments of, you know, my brother who had always a brother that's eight and a half years older than me. I kind of always like saw what he did and, and judge where I was at as a result. So he kind of became this like comparison anti North star of like how well I'm doing instead of thinking, man, look at this wonderful quality that I really, really admire in myself and others. And I never really gave him credit for that. So I, I want to be known as somebody that helps people feel like they belong like he did. And uh, for having brought this concept of community creation as a really, really viable business model to the average business. How can we support you? <laughs> uh you know, go to uh, check out the B2B Community Builder Show on any podcast platform that you listen to and tune in live one time. Show up and, and watch the internet talk show and give me some good feedback. I would love to I would love to see you there. We are about to wrap up. I like to have a few words about your today's guest experience on the show. Here's my question. What would you say about your today's guest experience on the show? little bit different Muhammad. I'm used to these things being a little bit more conversational and this was more just like a kind of like standard question rapid fire interview. I, I would uh, I'd recommend uh, you know maybe 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 getting more involved in the conversation because I'm sure you have a lot to offer to it and I would love to see that happen. What would you say as a final word? Human beings are the quintessential social animal. Right? We didn't evolve out of caves because we were faster than other animals or stronger than other animals or had thicker skin or anything like that. We got out of caves because we learned how to work with each other. And within that, within that skill set is the idea of recognizing the value in the person in front of you and understanding how it fits in relation to what the group is trying to accomplish. So it is the fundamental human skill set to see value in other people and enlist it in a common mission. And if you were to work on doing that as much as possible, approach people with curiosity instead of judgment and see the other as a asset instead of a threat, then you will live a richer, fuller life. Thank you so much, Pablo, for sharing your wisdom with us today on the behalf of Growth Hacking Secrets community and our entire team, we really appreciate you. This is Mohammed Siddiq signing off from Atlanta, Georgia. Until the next episode, all good wishes. Cool, thanks, Mohammed.